So I, I think I kind of unexpectedly lost some of the recordings of these. Um, but what I was trying to, uh, where was I? So this we've gone through last time. Correct. So the story so far. This is the set of posts. <clears throat> so th this part we went through, uh, and this part we. I'm not so sure if this is the one that I lost or not. Let me quickly take a look. Let me quickly take a look. Exactly. Yeah. This is the one that, so basically where I left is, I was trying to understand. So in this part, um, James explains how you're actually encoding stuff. And if I understood this well, so how are you storing a qubit? And so he talks about the different ways to um, make loops around this thing, uh, where you once, like from, from one side, you go th through the white squares and and then on from another perspective, you also go through the blue squares like this, and then you count the the, the number, then you add up the numbers and then see whether they are even or odd. Um, and and then I think it all boils down. It all boils down to counting the number of loops that go through the donut here and loops that go around the donut uh so storing a qubit it says no, 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 no. associate the zero and some of them to associate the one so for yeah that's how you do the repetition uh with the repetition code in the last post we had a little wish list of things uh, yeah, so basically, it's going to measure with just one physical qubit whether there are, are an odd or even numbers of loops around the donut. For this, we need our measurement to involve a whole bunch of physical qubits. We need a knot for a loop through the donut. Otherwise, we will leave a gap. Any loops that go through the gap will mess up with the measurement. To loop through the donut. So basically, so you're basically saying you need to measure. You need to have at least at least four. I need to measure at least four of these squares to, to kind of go through. Uh, sorry, through the uh, through the donut, and then th the same applies for for loops that go across the donut, not across, like, yeah, around the donut. Uh, anyway, okay, na -ni, na -ni, na -ni. the last boss we had a little wish list. Yeah, I keep getting lost of it. Um, kind of measure it says, physical cues loop through the donut. So this is perfect. I'm here. Uh, uh, uh. So let's use a bunch of physical qubits with an even number. Let's use a bunch of physical qubits with an even number of loops around the donut. For the zero. So we could set the physical bits to the values in A or B, as well as loads of other possibilities. If we want our logical qubit to be one, Let's use an odd number of loops around the donut. Okay, so it's it's for all of them around the donut. It's just an even number of loops is zeros and an, and an odd number of loops is a one. Now our logical bit value has been stored and we can not see whether it is zero or one without measuring a whole bunch of qubits, just as we wanted, but we have another wish to be fulfilled, we want it to be hard to turn a zero into a one, sort of for an error to happen, which also kind of happens because uh, because basically um, for, for you to do that, you need to 
go from an even number of loops to an odd number of loops. This means you actually need to either add an entire loop or remove an entire loop. And that's kind of, it's more difficult for this to happen. Yeah. Okay. But what about, what about superpositions and all this kind of stuff? So this is just a convention. Oops, around the down end. Okay. You know, it's gone through. You may think of loopholes to mess everything up. So I need to do flips on lots of physical qubits. At the moment, loopholes do exist. Mm. And we wonder if this is all quite true. I mean. I mean, the truth is that there could be some, some situations where just by changing one value, you could already turn one of the loops into a an odd loop, and then automatically you're removing one uneven loop, so to say. So I'm not so sure if that's so. Well, let's see. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go ahead and see what. So this one, okay. I'm going to guess that no one jumps into part three of something without looking part one into three. Yeah, part one to two. Yeah, summary. We have a bunch of qubits which we uh, call physical qubits. Okay, so it's a summary. Uh, to not do anything useful, make a useful qubit which we call a logical qubit. We put a physic. We put our physical qubits on a grid. Here, the physical qubits aren't just allow, allowed to choose whether to be zero or one randomly. They have to follow the rules. The rules state that every white, every white square must have an even number of ones around it. Mm. Okay. Then I don't really. I think I'm not so sure I understood. The word loop. Uh, I feel kind of stupid at the moment. We want to make it relatively hard to see whether our logical qubit value is zero or one, so we don't want some. Gremlin coming along measuring it because he might mess up. This means, you know, me measurement as an error, right? So we take physical qubits down in blue. So we take the physical qubits shown in blue below or the one shown in green or any other loop that passes through blue squares and goes through the donut. We just add up all the physical qubit values along one of these loops. If the answer is odd, Ah, uh, the logical qubit value is one. If it's even, the logical qubit is zero. So I, I, I don't know. Either, either I read, uh, either I read through that in the wrong way. Uh, it, it just confused the hell out of me. The, the white square squares, the blue squares, looping, not looping. Um. <laughs> The summary is probably good enough. So, <laughs> so the okay. So it's good to know. Um, any uh, that passes uh, uh, for rules. Okay, so the rules say that every white square must have an even number of ones around it, and that's sort of a rule. Okay. White squares. Every white squares. And then to encode the zeros are the ones we what we do is we just add up all the physical qubit qubit values along one of these loops. If 
the answer is odd, the logical qubit value is 1. If it is even, the logical qubit value is 0. It turns out that this measures the number of loops of 1s that pass through white spaces, uh, through white squares around the torus, and tells us whether it's odd or even. The examples in A and B don't have loops like these. So they come out even. If we want our logical qubit value to be zero, we could use one of these or a whole bunch of other possibilities. It's going to have one of these loops, so they come out odd. If we want our logical qubit value to be one, we could use a whole bunch of other possibilities. Ah, I feel stupid right now. And this measures the number of loops of ones that pass through white squares. Just add up all the physical qubit values along one of these loops. Along just one of these loops. The answer is odd the logical qubit value is one. If it's even the logical qubit value is zero. I think what confuses me is that this just seems too easy to mess up with, but uh, because you know, as soon as one of those changes, then you're you're messed up already with your with these. But but then there's this rule that there can only be an even amount of ones within a white square, which I don't know how this is ensured. But if this is something that always happens, then it would make sense, right? Because then modifying one would not be enough, because then if you modify this, but you want the constraint of this square having an even number of ones, uh, you know, then then something else has to change. So that's not that simple. So if you want to change the, if what you're measuring then at the end of the day is the um, number of loops loops of ones that pass through white squares. And, and whether this is odd or even, that's going to mess up with your... Because as soon as you change one number, it's going to change somewhere else. But if, if that's that's the way it works, I don't know. Let's just go ahead. Maybe there's some, some more examples in here. How much effort would it take to mess everything up? If we, if we make a logical qubit with value 0, for example, how could errors make us think it was 1? Suppose we make our logical qubit using A, and so all physical qubits are set to 0. Then an error happens, flipping one of the physical qubits to 1, for example, this one. Why is the red line there? You may ask. Don't worry. It'll make sense later. For the blue physical cube, for the blue physical qubits. So what are physical qubits? The white, the blue, or the numbers in the middle? This looks exactly the same as in C. If we measure whether our logical qubit by looking at this, it will take us tell us that the value is one. That's wrong. All is lost. Well, not well, not quite yet. Remember that the zeros and ones in the grid have to follow. The okay, that's what I said. They have to follow the rules. This error has broken them. The white squares either either side of it now have an odd number of ones around them. I have given them an orange or an orange border to shame them for their rebellion. Um, to make things more interesting, let's have a few more errors happen. Also, maybe this is the, this is a way to ensure we can detect the error. Ah, okay. So the rule of an even number of ones is to then help us detect the error to make things. What happens? Okay. Here we have three all near each other. They form a little string of ones.
for every square the rules are obeyed. This is because the string contributes two ones, so one when it enters and one when it leaves. But the ends of the string are a different story. These squares only get a single one. They have an odd number of ones, they are breaking the rules. Correcting errors. Ah, so, I mean, that would allow us to correct errors. Because then you, know, you can basically flip any. If, if, you, if, you bring, if you bring those those rules back, then that maybe somehow corrects your error. Um, finding the rule breaking squares gives us a clue about what errors have happened. We know what they are, uh, what they for. We know that they form a string and that the orange squares are the endpoints. That doesn't tell us exactly what happened in both cases, both for the single error and the rules are broken in the same places. We can correct the errors if we don't know what the error happened. If the errors are rare, the single error of E is a lot more likely than if errors are rare, the single error of E is a lot more likely than than three in F. So we would assume there was E that happened. To correct it, we would flip the corresponding physical qubit. If we were right and it, it really was E that, that happened, the one is flipped back to zero, everything is back to, to how it was. All the physical qubits will have the values of A and the rules are obeyed and our logical qubit is back to having a value of zero. If we're wrong and it was F that happened, then we add to the string rather than removing it. The addition joins the ends together making a loop. This is just a little loop, not one that goes around the donut. In fact, it is the same loop as in, as in B, which also corresponds to logical qubit. With value zero, I, I'm you lost me with the loops. I I probably have to read the whole thing again. <laughs> loops that go through, loops that go around, and then we are counting the loops. What are we counting? Uh, we could have chosen to use these values for our physical qubits in the first place. Um, so everything is fine. Errors have not been removed, but they have been integrated into society as productive and low. I mean, for example, it seems like the errors still leave a trace. They have added a little loop where now was before, but we can only see it. But we can only see this because we are currently letting ourselves look at whether each cube is zero or one. Actually doing these measurements would itself source be a source of errors. Uh, just a flip just as bit flips are here. So in the end the only things that we'll be able to look at are whether the rules are obeyed and what the loop around the donut is doing. As long as the errors don't affect these and the observable Effect is completely removed. Flips. So, when a bunch of B flips happen, it is best to think of them in terms of strings. When we look at the squares and find out which ones break the rules, it tells us where the endpoints of the strings are. Then we have to try and stick the ends together and make loops. Okay, we might do not do this exactly right, we might end up making the loop bigger than it needs to be, we might end up combining a few different strings into the same loop, but that doesn't matter. All that matters is that none of the loops pass around the donut, uh, pass around the donut. As long as we achieve this, our logical qubit value will not change. The errors will have failed to have an effect. It can be that we will get it wrong if, no, if noise creates, it can be that we will get it wrong if noise creates a string of flips that get, that goes almost all the way around the donut. We'll probably end up completing it by mistake. But this needs a lot, a lot of errors to happen and for all of them to lie along the same loop. This is pretty unlikely, so we'll end up nicely correcting our errors most of the time. What else do we know? We've now sent the storage given and how to protect it from errors. So what else? Well, I forgot about B flip errors. Exactly, I was going to say, what about phase flip errors? Um, we've got our measuring things that they shouldn't. Okay, so measurement errors, they, they have to do a lot of it because, you know, because we can measure the logical qubit values without looking at a whole bunch of qubits. But that's not the only trick that the Tori code has up its sleeve. Next time, we'll take a look at how to foil this kind of error. But I don't see I don't see a link to the next time. I hope that there is an actual part three. Where is this? Uh, March. It looks like there isn't a part three. 
because the science behind the games, this is something else. Okay, but there's a game about it. Bay the Great Shop Below. The game, the inner workings of the game. How the game works. April. Maybe in April. Oh yes! Part 4. You just missed to link it. Cool. Okay. Okay, so we'll go through this. But I think I'll first kind of try to go through that again and then maybe make a summary at the beginning of the next video. Um, and I probably got to save this link somewhere, otherwise I'll get lost. Um, exactly. Uh, and then at the end we can play the game, maybe. Hey, I, I roughly, I, I have a rough idea, but it just, I, I just got my head messed up with these loops. Looping, not looping, counting. What are we, what are we counting? What have... And, and and what are physical qubits and where we do we have here? How do we even encode superpositions or or sort of you know values which are not zeros and ones? I don't know, uh, but but I get the mechanism sort of at, at a high level that. Um, you you you're using the geometry of 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 that of that figure that donut to to basically say you know it's it's really difficult for errors to actually uh, happen and uh, we can quickly identify them thanks to those geometric properties and then fix them but I'm kind of got a bit a bit a bit messed up let's see I'll give it another try later today perfect.